You're listening to the Globetrotters Podcast, the show dedicated to bringing you fresh and diverse perspectives from traveling enthusiasts all over the world. Here at the Globetrotters Podcast, we hope to show that travel is so much more than how it's represented on social media and television by bringing you real stories, thoughtful discussions on ethical issues, and investigations into how you can make the most of an adventure without breaking the bank. I'm your co-host, Jonathan Otero. And I'm Saskia Hatvani. And our last episode was The Layover, the monthly show where John and I delve into the latest travel headlines, give practical travel tips, and every once in a while, we'll investigate a questionable social media trend. But today, we welcome our guest, Caitlin Rosati. She is a freelance travel writer, solo traveler, and part-time New York bartender who has been to six continents, 68 countries, and all seven world wonders. Did I get that right? Caitlin has an interesting path to becoming a travel writer and also a lot to share about what it means to write and travel for food, especially as a solo female traveler. We'll also pick her brain for a few travel food tips and some of her favorite places to eat in the world at the end, so stick around for that. So if you're a foodie or interested in the life of a travel writer, this is the episode for you. Caitlin, it's nice to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. First of all, I wanted to get into, you know, your path to becoming a travel writer because it's, it's like I said, it's not a traditional one. And before writing, you were a full-time bartender in New York, correct? That is correct. I was a bartender for, I like to say 10 years. It's something in that time frame. It's <laughs> like eight, but round up, right? Um, and I got very, very burnt out. Bartending in New York is mm. great money. Truthfully, probably some of the best money I'll ever make. But mm. the hours are terrible. Um, you can easily make a career out of it. But it just, I, I hit around like 27, mm. 28 years old and realized I wanted something more out of life. I just was stuck yeah. in that mundane, as I called it, hamster wheel cycle of just waking up, doing the same thing, going to bed, waking up. So yeah, yeah. so I started to save money. And I had this dream to be one of those people who like sold all their stuff and quit their jobs <laughs> and like bought a one way and had all the excuses in the world, right? Like, Mm -hmm. I had a dog. Who's going to watch my dog? You know, I'm stuck in an apartment lease. Uh, I was in a relationship at one point. Uh, my sister was getting married. I had to be home for Christmas. Any, any excuse you could think of. Mm -hmm. And finally, one day I was like, nope, you know what? I'm doing it. I'm booking it. And if I have a ticket, Good for you. there's going to be a date. So I booked a one-way ticket to Tahiti um, uh, for January 15th, 2019. And I booked that ticket in uh, June of 2018. So I was like, all right, we have six months. And my goal was to save $30,000. I was nowhere near that. I think when I booked the ticket, I had like four grand saved. And and I'm going to ask the, fir the first follow-up question here. And usually I get the rhetorical answer, why not? But why Tahiti? Yeah, no, of course. Why Tahiti? I was uh, <laughs> So I really didn't know where I wanted to start. I had mapped out in my notes app places I wanted to go. Um, and I was torn on, st I really wanted it to be a proper round the world trip. Like I wanted to mm. physically go around the world. So my options were start as close to home as possible, which would have been for me, either Iceland or Portugal, you know, somewhere on Europe's West coast, essentially, or start as far away as possible and work my way back home. And since it's more, sounds more exciting. It, oh, of course, I was like, we're starting as far away as possible on a romantic island that everyone goes to for mm. their honeymoon, <laughs> and I'm going by myself, and I'm quitting my job. <laughs> so I just thought it was a little more exciting to do it that way. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I love, I love the way you put it because I think most people can relate to this fantasy of just ditching everything and just doing it. But then the reality, like you'll think about it as you're having a few glasses of wine and you're like, yeah, I'm going to do that. And then the next day you wake up, you're like, oh, what would I do with all my stuff? Like, what would I do with my animal? And, and, uh, but you actually are one of the few people who the small percentage that actually did it. So at the time when you did it, how much money had you saved at that point? By the time I took off, I had, let's put it this way. When I quit my job, which was December 18th, 2018, 
I had. You remember the day? I remember. Oh, <laughs> I wore a rainbow cat suit. I was like, three shots of tequila for everybody. I'm going to Tahiti. <laughs> uh, they can't fire me. I quit. Uh, <laughs> um, but I had hit twenty thousand dollars in savings. But I allowed mm-hmm. myself a little bit of wiggle room to kind of have like, you know, I wasn't leaving till mid January, so I gave myself mm-hmm. about give or take a month left in New York City, which is where I'm based out of or where I'm tip typically based out of when I'm not, you know, in Tahiti. Um, Mm -hmm. And I, so, you know, I treated some of my friends who had like been really supportive of this radical idea to like a really nice dinner. You know, I, I like really enjoyed New York city, which I think when you live in a place you forget to do. So those three weeks leading up to the trip were really fun because I was like, you know, if I, if I blow through 1500 or two grand, whatever, right. It's part of it. It begins now. So when I left to answer your question, I had somewhere around $18,000. What was your plan? And like, how did that then turn into you becoming a travel writer? Yeah, the plan was there was no plan. Um, I had (laughs) the best kind of plan. (laughs) Like I said, I had this like notes app. Uh, or I'm sorry, a a note in my notes app on my iPhone of potential places I wanted to go. But there were like maybe 70 countries listed. Like it was a very, here's where I would go if given the opportunity. And so uh, before I left, I narrowed it down to be a little more, my least favorite word, realistic. Places that I could easily scratch off, right? Like Southeast Asia, generally affordable, generally easy to travel throughout places that might be more difficult to go to, like the Maldives, Madagascar, um, and places I wouldn't mind returning to. Italy and Japan were at the top of those lists. So uh, when I before I left, I booked a flight from Tahiti. Tahiti is in the middle of nowhere, so I knew it would be wise Correct. to <laughs> seriously. Right? So I'm like, we should probably yeah, one of the hardest places to get out of. Right. Like, <laughs> yeah. We should probably buy an exit ticket just to not really wing it in Tahiti, right? Mm-hmm. So I all, Smart. all I had planned was Tahiti to New Zealand, New Zealand to Australia, uh, and that was it. And once I got to Australia, I was like. We'll see where I end up. And I really Mm. just use Skyscanner for the majority of that trip. I would be like, all right, time to move on. I would go on Skyscanner, find the cheapest flight out. And if it was somewhere I was interested in going to, that's where I went. And then fast forward to now. I mean, you are a columnist for the New York Daily News, correct? And you've written for a bunch of different travel publications like The Point Sky. Uh, What are some of the other ones? Flipboard, The Travel, Jet Set Times. Um, So... How did you get from ditching all your, you know, your life basically and responsibilities, you know, going to travel and then becoming like, how did you get to becoming a travel writer? Yeah, that was the the second part of that first question, huh? Um, so <laughs> ca- it's all right. no, casually brushed over it. I'm like, we'll edit it yeah, out. <laughs> um, so when I was traveling, I was in, I, I want to say I was on month two or three. Uh, it was around March 2019, and I realized I had been running out of space on my passport, which was an issue. I was in Vietnam when I noticed this, and I really that's a so so what does that mean? Because so, I've never actually heard of that issue. You run out of space on your like physical space on your passport pages for stamps, and then you need to apply for a replacement. Yeah, it was something I was not prepared for. I was like, huh, yeah. what am I supposed to do? And I, I really thought I would have to fly back to the US, which I was very against doing. I'm like, no, I mm. just started this trip. Like I said, I was I, I want to say I was on month two. And I'm like, I'm not going back already, right? Like the whole point is like, you know, to properly travel around the world. So I started Googling, what does one do when they run out of space on a passport? And essentially the answer I got from the U.S. Embassy website was you need to turn your old passport in, but wherever you turn it in, be prepared to be passportless in another country for three to four weeks. So I'm a fast traveler. I know some people like to spend months at a time to really get to know a place. I do like a few days, cram a bunch of stuff in there, you know, and then get out and move on, especially for this trip. Finally, someone on this podcast that is like me. So <laughs> the other two co-hosts love to lounge around for six to seven months in the beach and chill. <laughs> I'm like, no, there's places to do things to do, places to see. Let's go. Let's cram three days in in this city and move on to the next. Let's go. Pura vida, John. <laughs> Life is for living. <laughs> I mean, there are definitely pros and cons to both. 
I'm listen, I guess that aggressive New Yorker in me just can't sit still for that long, right? I'm like, I gotta go. I got places to be. Even when I have quit yeah. my job and sold all my stuff, I still have places to be. Good for you. Yeah. So I I was like, I'm already in Southeast Asia. I really wanted to do Lao, Myanmar, Cambodia, but when I had I want to say three pages left on the passport. It's like, okay, well, we got to cut something out. So I did go to Cambodia, which took up an entire page. With I know. That's what I was going to say. Oh, my gosh. The Cambodian visa takes is like a giant piece of paper that takes up one whole page. It's not just like a little stamp. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, very wise decision. I'm, I'm like, cool. Now we are down. I was down to a, a page. And uh, so from Cambodia, I was like, all right, I got to figure out where I'm going booked my ticket from Cambodia, but of course had to get like a few extra places in there. So I did Hong Kong and South Korea on the way because neither of them stamp passports. I was like, I can just do a few more places. <laughs> and then I was in Japan. And so I rented this apartment for the month, turned in my passport, uh, got it back two days later, not three to four weeks. Um, wow. did, did you have it expedited? I have to ask. No. And so I still, to this day, That's so weird. I believe it was Japan, Japanese efficiency, not U.S. efficiency. Uh, I believe it. And, right. And so, you know, I'm, I don't want to say stuck, but I paid for an apartment in Tokyo for a month. So like I am staying in Tokyo, right? Like I'm not. Mm. And so when I was there, uh, it's not exactly budget friendly. So that, you know, imposed its challenges. Of course, I probably should have yeah. thought about that before I left. Um, so when I was there, I was thinking, I really worked on my blog a lot, which I realize I haven't even mentioned yet. I do have a blog. It's called No Man Nomad. Mm. And because I had been moving so much, I hadn't updated it. And so I was working on it, updating it on Vietnam. And I was thinking I should just like apply for some of these publications you know, out there. Um, and so I applied for all the big guys like Forbes. Tra now, mind you, I have no travel experience or travel writing experience under my belt. I have a blog with maybe 20 posts and like a really crappy design. Uh, <laughs> you know, no, I know nothing about SEO and all the things I've learned over the years. And so I'm applying to like Forbes and Travel and Leisure and Condé Nast. And, uh, I'm not getting a response. And so I was like, you know, I need to start smaller. And I started looking for tiny, you know, tinier publications. And I, I came across one called Jet Set Times. And mm -hmm. they had like maybe 20,000 followers on Instagram. And so I sent them a DM. I just like slid into their DMs. I was like, are you looking for travel writers? I'm currently like on a backpacking trip. I have, you know, current experience, which is really important mm -hmm. in publishing. And they wrote yeah. back and they were like, yeah, let's set up a Skype call. So I had like a, a job interview. I think it was 3 a.m. in Tokyo when I had the interview because they were in another <laughs> time zone. And I got the gig and I started writing. And that was the beginning for me. So that's the shortened beginning version, but obviously there's a lot more to come. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's pretty amazing. So you were actually just saying, Hey, do you need travel writers? You weren't finding a job like listing and applying to that. No, I, I never, at that time, I have many times since I didn't Google travel writer jobs, uh, travel mm. reporters, you know, food mm. writer. I just, I, I wanted, I just, I, I mean, I literally slid into someone's DMs. So it's always funny right. when people say, how did you break into this? Like people will ask me that are curious. Right. And I'm like, be shameless, yeah. slide into their DMs. Like that is how I started, yeah. you know? And so Caitlin, slowly over time, as you're making this journey, when do you start to pivot away from travel writing and start getting more into the food critic scene? Yeah, so I would like to say I try to uh, deter from ever calling myself a food critic only because, okay. I mean, uh, which is fine. It's every time I'm like, hi, I'm a writer and I'm here to write about food. Like, oh, you're a food critic. I'm like, no, I just, I, you know, I'm not like going to sit there and be like, oh, this pasta isn't perfectly al dente, you know, <laughs> knocking one point, right? Like, I, I'm mm. very appreciative of anything that's placed in front of me. Um, so I guess I'm just a food lover. But um, <laughs> I... I had, listen, travel and food go hand in hand. And I think Correct. one of the silliest things travelers can rob themselves of is by showing up with restrictions, unless, of course, there's an allergy or perhaps a religious reason. I was a vegetarian mm -hmm. for four years. And I just, I even to this day, I mean, 
listen, this is on the record, right? Like I do have <laughs> moral conflict on eating octopus. Like I'm fully aware like how mm -hmm. inhumane it is to eat octopus. But I recently went on a trip and someone gave me a plate of octopus. And if I'm going to be that righteous person and say, I can't eat this, like it's against my book, mm -hmm. I just will, I'll eat, I'll eat the damn octopus, you know? And then in mm -hmm. my, in my time, in my choosing, I will not eat the octopus, right? Mm -hmm. So, um... I had always kept an open mind when it came to food. Um, and I wouldn't say I even wrote too much about food in my early writing days, but my first true food story was during COVID because I couldn't travel like the rest of us. And Bourdain's documentary came out, Roadrunner. And so now I knew a thing or two about SEO and what people are searching for. And uh, I knew Bourdain had skyrocketed in Google searches because of his documentary being released. And I, I pitched to Jet Set Times. I said, hey, let me write a story on all the places Bourdain has eaten in New York City. Like, I, it doesn't require me traveling. I live here. And that was my that was my first true food story. And that's where the shift really began. Yeah, I mean, Bourdain is an example of someone who is obviously incredibly successful in this realm. Can you talk briefly about how sustainable has this been for you? And like, how much are you able, are, are you able to support yourself 100% with your writing? Um, I am, well, you know, it depends on the month. Am I able to support myself? Some months are incredible. <laughs> Other months I'm like at, I don't know if you're familiar with Buffalo Exchange, uh, uh -huh, other months, course. I'm Love Buffalo. at Buffalo Exchange, hoping I get sixty dollars for my clothes. Right? It's, mm. it's not, and that's why I said earlier the the most money I I I mean never say never, right? Um, the most money up to this point that I've ever made was as a full time bartender, and so it's really important to me. Bringing it back to Bourdain, that's another thing he was so incredible about about being mm. kind to wait staff and to service workers because they are they right. are the backbone of in my opinion the world right like mm -hmm. they are and so mm -hmm. um i have made anywhere between zero dollars on an article uh i was gonna ask <laughs> zero dollars to the most i've gotten paid for a single story is 750 dollars mm. yeah not bad yeah and that's uh that's rare, but that has happened. Mm -hmm. um, I would say for full transparency, there's no gatekeeping here. Uh, in at least listen for some of the big shop publications, you should be expecting at least at least three hundred dollars an article as a freelancer. Uh -huh. Occasionally, yeah. it'd be closer to two hundred, but and you know, listen, charge if you're doing original photography. Put it on the bill, mm -hmm. thing, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. we got to know your worth, which is difficult because I know what it feels like to feel so gracious for these opportunities, um, which is why I've worked yeah. for zero dollars. Right. And mm -hmm. I've worked for fifteen dollars. Um, but if they have over a million readers a month, they, they can pay you a little bit more. So tips from Caitlin. <laughs> And I wasn't going to ask this question because it's a little a little bit of a sidetrack, but um, can you talk a little bit about the importance of networking in your field, if, if that's an approach that you take to learning more about, you know, this scene that you're now part of? I actually, I'm glad you asked that question because I, that is something I'm currently struggling with. I feel like I haven't actually written in about two weeks because mm -hmm. I do get invited to a lot of network. And then, and I'll listen, when I first sent that DM to Jet Set Times, I knew nothing. Like I didn't know about... PR agents. I didn't know about how to reach out to tourism, but I knew nothing. Um, I didn't know about engagement rates. So I do a little of two things. I, I freelance, right? But I also run No Man Nomad. And in my dream world, I will work for myself and I will be No Man Nomad yeah. and I will get paid for my blog and skip and frolic happily into a field and mm. answer to nobody. But I'm not quite there yet. So I, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I frequently get invited um to networking events in New York City specifically, since that's where I'm based. This kind of started last year. I started writing for The Point Sky, which uh, mm -hmm. I did get that gig from Googling travel writer, uh, travel uh -huh. writer jobs. So that one was a bit of a more traditional route. And um, that was how I landed that job. And The Point Sky has quite a large reach. So some public relations agents or reps found me got access to my email address and started you know 
emailing me, hey, there's a new hotel that just opened in Greece. Would you want to write about it? There's a new hotel that opened in San Francisco. Yeah. And mm. now uh, something I wish I knew was that a lot of times they're not inviting you to go to Greece or San Francisco. They're just trying to get you to write about it. Uh, right. So I'd be like, sure, when do you want me to come? And they're like, that's not how this works. You know, I, I didn't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. I do get invited to a lot of specific tourism events. So like, mm. Um, I recently went to a tourism event in New York for the Bahamas. I went to one for London. I'm going to one next week for Berlin. And so it's a lot of rubbing elbows and running out of yeah. business cards and yeah. socializing. So if you have social anxiety, like I do, then um, it can be <laughs> a little tough, but it's part of the gig. Yeah. So, so I'm curious when you say uh, the goal is to, to, you know, work for yourself and run your blog, uh, no man, no man, and make income through that. Would that be primarily through advertising or crowdfunding or both? A bit of both. So, and I shouldn't say that's the only thing I want to do because I really, really, really love my column with New York Daily News. It's like, if, mm. you know, it's such it's it's such light years better. I shouldn't say better because this is on the record. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's it's been such a rewarding experience to kind of they really trust me. They're like. Mm -hmm here you go, just do it, send us the story, you know, and a lot of it yeah. is micromanaging and having to change things. And it's just, it's a very different experience with them. Mm -hmm. um, but with No Man Nomad, I sometimes, I have around 15,000 readers a month on my blog right now. Um, and that started at, mm -hmm. like I said, zero with a crappy web design. Yeah. And I mean, one of my oldest posts, it's, I think it's literally called uh, Cinque Terre. Like, so the it just says Cinque Terre. Mm -hmm. Why is somebody going to read my post that says Cinque Terre when there's so much information <laughs> out there, right? So, like, just I've, I've learned a lot over the years. Uh, <laughs> I look this is something that I've tried to explain to John in the past. <laughs> Be specific. Putting me on blast. Huh? Be specific. We got to have specific titles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I have a lot like that. Or one was like uh, the name of a waitress I met in Colombia. It's like Ariana from Colombia. Like, girl, nobody cares. Like, nobody's clicking on that, right? And, you can't. And that was obviously your your biggest hit, right? Like, that was like fifteen thousand clicks. Right and that's there. when I went viral um, <laughs> from Cinque Terre and Ariana combined. Um, so, because I've learned a little bit more over the years, I've done. I do affiliate links. I do advertisements, and mm -hmm. I get paid Great. by tourism boards to write. So, like, I've done a lot of um u.s destinations i've worked with uh, the state of texas i've worked hmm. with michigan i've worked with brands i've worked with like a brand called way away i've worked with a brand called the parking spot and what i'll offer for a price because it's a service is to write mm -hmm. an article and make an instagram reel for them mm. and um yeah it's sometimes it's a little mind-blowing because i'm like this is crazy, you know, that like I can charge people for this and mm -hmm. correct. Yeah. And so going back back to your blog, you know, you wrote something called Will the World Ever Be Ready for a Female Bourdain, you know, referring to the chef, you know, Anthony Bourdain. Um, can you explain the story behind that blog post? Yes. Um, I did an interview a few years ago. Somebody reached out to me. Um, they wanted to interview they were doing a highlight on uh, solo female travelers and they so sure sounds great i'd love to be the face of solo female travel right so i agreed to it and the questions were incredibly disappointing now listen I so you you were on a panel like or on like a you were at a speaking engagement it was a was it was still peak it, i i want to say it was it was summer 2021 so it was virtual it was not a panel mm -hmm. it was something for a website and um it was filmed and it was to be like published almost yeah. as mm -hmm. like an episode of this like weekly thing they were doing uh not a, not quite a podcast but uh <laughs> and i had i knew the website i respected the website so i was excited for it and I sent them, I, I took a lot of time to craft uh, a little package saying, here's all like the cool, can I swear on this podcast? Yeah, yeah of course. Cool. Okay, all the cool shit I've done, right? Like, I'm like, I've climbed <laughs> Kilimanjaro by myself. I got scuba certified in the Great Barrier Reef. I road trip New Zealand. Hell yeah. You know, I quit my job and traveled the world. Like, I'm working on Italian, whatever. I gave them 
plenty of i ran out of space on a passport and moved to japan right like and um when i got on the po- or not the podcast when i when I, the interview began uh it was all and i listen i understand right the world is dangerous blah 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 so the, all the questions were like what tips would you provide for women to stay safe. That is not, and an, you know, that's a valid question, right? For someone who has traveled mm-hmm. all over, I get it. Safety is a concern. Um, and then it was like, what country would you never go back to? And I'm like, mm-hmm. I, I don't love like answering questions. I mean, do I have my, an- actually, honestly, I would go back anywhere. I would go back anywhere just because I had mm-hmm. a bad experience somewhere. It doesn't mean it's going to happen again. I've had way worse mm-hmm. experiences in the U.S., right? Um, right. And, totally. And I just was like, are you going to ask me anything, like, positive? Or is this all just going to be, like, a fear-mongering type of thing? And then the golden question was, what What have you done to avoid getting sexually assaulted abroad? Hmm. And I'm like, what have I done to get avoid sexually? Do you think I carry a golden mm-hmm. shield? Because, like, mm-hmm. I've traveled to some – like, that is not – it's not what I do to – you can not walk alone yeah. at night. You can, you know, carry pepper spray, except you really can't, obviously. Don't take that as advice. Do not bring pepper spray with you to another country. Um, you know, you can do... They stopped you at the airport, huh? <laughs> they, they stopped me. Um, I'm like, you can bring a dagger. Just kidding. Don't do that. Um, you know, I just the, the way that question was framed, uh, what do I do to avoid being sexually assaulted? I... I I didn't say it in the moment, but I thought like, you know, as long as like predatory men exist in this world, like I, I could, there's not enough measures I can take. Like that's just always the mm-hmm. risk that's going to be there. And right. so I ended up emailing them afterward and just saying, listen, unfortunately, you didn't even ask me about travel. You just essentially asked me what my experience is like as a woman in this world. And I just, yeah. and I've seen other episodes that they had done and it was a lot of dudes and the questions mm-hmm. were like, oh man, you went to Syria. That's crazy. Like, how did you do that? You know? And it's like, this right. world fest but with me it's like <laughs> what can you do to avoid getting raped and i'm like mm, like that's not you know my identity yeah. so that is when i wrote right. that that piece and were they receptive towards um you know the email that you sent them they were um frustrated that i i don't know uh held up up. i i agreed to redo it i said listen i don't this is not how i want to be represented I was mm-hmm. under the impression we were going to talk about my travels. We pretty much did not do that. We only talked about staying safe as a woman. And I I don't mind if that's included, but for that to be the sole focus is like a little insulting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's just a bit out of touch. I mean, and at, like you said, just being reduced to the fact that you are a woman, that's not your entire story. That's maybe an element of your experience right but it's not like your entire experience and it's not all that you have to offer as a a traveler so um interesting that that was so that was the starting point to that that's what that sorry let me rephrase that that is what um ultimately gave you the inspiration to write this article yes and I just thought, and I, I, I said this in my email to them. I said, you know, if um, I really want you to ask yourselves this, and I'm not saying this to be snarky, but like if a, a man was on your show or, you know, video series, would you ever ask, what do you do to control yourself from raping women? Like it is the same question reversed. You would never ask that. And I, I at the time, you know, of course, I, I'm always watching Bourdain, right? Like he's been inspiration for me for so many and I had watched a lot of Bourdain leading up to that interview because I was thinking of how I want to frame things and I was looking for inspiration. And that's what I said, you know, Bourdain would never have been asked this. He would never have been asked anything like this. And so that's why I framed it as, will the world ever be ready for a female version of Anthony Bourdain, essentially, because are we always just going to get asked stupid questions? And, and you know, I do want to be transparent here because I don't want to get called a hypocrite afterwards. For the first 10, I want to say 10 episodes that we produced, those were questions that I was asking in part. Again, I wasn't making the entire story about that. But it is interesting to to get your perspective because we've I've shifted away from asking those types of questions. And I think it's important for 
people to hear what you have to say about it so they, they can grow from it and learn from it. So, you know, thank you for saying that. And, and I want to be first one here that says, you know, that has his hand up and says, I have made those mistakes in the past. Yeah, but I mean, like I said, there's really nothing wrong. I'm not, I understand. I mean, when I tell people I solo travel, almost always the first question is, is that safe? Is that, I get it. It is a concern. So it does yeah. need to be talked about. My issue with it was that it was the entire the only yeah i was no, no, never no, asked understood. you know come on like i gave i put i sent you this package well like i said all this cool shit i've done they did not ask me a single thing about it so it's just frustrating mm -hmm. and uh and talk about the the story too at the beginning of this i i really enjoyed the blog post by the way i thought it was really nicely written so if anyone's listening and they want to go read it we'll link to it let's say on our website. Um, and so at the beginning, you sort of mentioned a story about how you're sitting at a bar and there was a man sitting next to you and Bourdain was on TV. So can you tell me about that story as well? Yeah, that was uh, in, in New York. And this was, so originally I had written that piece and I didn't want to put it out there. It was more just like for my own, you know, uh, you know, almost like just to get it out of my system. Right. And, then I want to say that was probably last year. I was sitting at a bar in New York and I was drinking like really, really awful tasting wine, which is great. Amazing. So I say I'm not a food critic. I got a second glass. Couldn't have been that bad. <laughs> um, and, and there was like a there was a light on behind me because there was a TV and I turned around. It was a very old episode of Bourdain. He was like cooking and this guy was like, oh, Bourdain. And, you know, I'm, I'm like, now the story is slipping my mind because you're putting me on the spot here. Hang on. I'm gonna... <laughs> we we oh, got yeah. into, no, it's okay. We got into like a, a mini, I don't want to say it was an altercation, although I will say one of one of my favorite um, pastimes is fighting men at bars in New York. So don't mind me. <laughs> Sorry to all the boys out there who ever run into me at a bar. Uh, <laughs> but he had made a sexist comment. I just remember that. He had made a sexist comment. And the bartender, I knew her, and we just kind of locked eyes. And we just were like, ugh, you know, and rolled our eyes. And, um, oh, that's right. That's what he said. And he said women aren't funny. Women can't be Bourdain. Like, cause I said, we're never going to have a female Bourdain. He said, women aren't funny. Women aren't funny, which is like the cheapest dig, right? It's like a, something that mm. like female comedians have had to deal with um, time and time again, that they're not funny. Uh, meanwhile, women comedian, now, I'm not a comedian. I'm not going down that route, but you know, some <laughs> we, women comedians are like top writers for some of our favorite TV shows, Saturday night live, the office 30 rock. Right. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's just a cheap dig. Um, yeah. And then I just kind of brushed him off and I was pissed and I had my laptop with me. And that was when I added that I was actually working on that story and I was oh, kind wow. of thinking about it. And I was like, thanks for the inspiration, man. Like, keep being a dick. <laughs> keep being a dick. I'm gonna write about you. Uh, yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, I encourage everyone to go read that article. We'll put uh, a link to Caitlin's blog there, and then also, you know, we'll link you on our Instagram and all that sort of stuff. But before we get to all that good stuff, um, let's shift the conversation a little bit to food, um, which is what you write about. And so before we get into a little rapid fire round, um, I want to know when you arrive to a new place, what is the first thing you do for food? Like, where do you look? Where do you go? So, of course, I am human and I live in 2023. So the Internet is there available for my <laughs> never ending Google curiosity, um, which I always research a place before I go but when I physically land in a place I try my best to just get rid of the Google and all the information I know and I find like I try to find like a gnarly looking place you know I, I like the places with like no restaurant signs or uh, mm. anybody who's been to Vietnam uh, you know they don't really I, I thought it was really funny there it's just like boon cha like every place is just called boon cha right because it's they, they don't have like actual names a lot of the restaurants so I try to find places mm -hmm. like that I go in I tell whoever's working listen it is my first meal in this place what would you order like I just landed mm -hmm. what would you get and uh, I call it like a restaurant roulette a little bit uh, I try not to look <laughs> at a menu and whatever I get I eat and so I highly encourage everybody to 
try to do that because you'll you'll get some you'll get some good stuff you'll get you'll get some mm. get some good stuff <laughs> the the, the person that's great with advice. the shrimp allergen is going to get shrimp scampini right <laughs> maybe if you have an allergy just mention that uh <laughs> right right i mean yeah by the way you mentioned um like you know that your dietary restrictions kind of go out the window when you travel and um i kind of uh, I thought that was an interesting thing to mention because um, what do people call it? Flexitarian. flexitarian um, for sure. I am sort of a flexitarian myself. It's sort of when, you know, depending on the situation and what's available, you change your dietary, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't like to call them dis- restrictions, parameters. Um, yeah. Was that a better word for it? I, I don't think know. so. Yeah. I think restrictions yeah. is a bit harsh, right? Because it's a bit it's hard. A bit harsh. Yeah. I think parameters, that's. Um... That's good. And so now, Caitlin, I'm really excited to move on to to this last portion of the show, the rapid fire portion of of our podcast, which we really got to come up with a better name than just rapid fire questions. But Um, we'll go. uh, Time travel. Time travel. No, I don't know. Time travel. Time Time travel. Uh, TBD, but you you can start us off. And it doesn't have to be that rapid fire. It's just that, like, we have a few questions here. Yeah. Um, we have so, the power of editing. We'll make number it one. You probably get this all the time. Uh, what is your favorite country for food? Oh, for food? Um, can I give three? Sure. Absolutely. Okay. Malaysia, Japan, Italy. All and good all options. Know, yeah, I know. Were you ranking them from least to greatest? Hmm. Honestly, okay, I can I can narrow them down. Malaysia because it was the most surprising for me. I just had no idea what the mm-hmm. food scene was like, and I mean, it, mm-hmm. it's it, it's absolutely incredible. Like out of this world, mind blowing. I was there only for two days. I ate probably fifty times. Like I just was like, I need to try everything <laughs> here because it was so <laughs> good. Um, Italy, mm-hmm. I mean, come on. I, I, do I need to explain? Like, come on. Yeah. It's, just, um, it's it's literally one of the best places for food I've ever been. Yeah. It's just, in, I'm and you know, I, it's like the only place I, I feel like when I travel, I tend to like stay in shape, right? Like I'm always moving, even if like I'm eating. All the yeah. time. Italy is like the only place I go and I leave and like my pants are tighter and I'm like, yeah. In <laughs> um, Japan, it's just so fresh. Like the quality yeah. is just absolutely mm-hmm unlike anywhere else in the world you know i'm spoiled like i said i had that apartment in tokyo to this day i just can't eat japanese i mean i will but it's difficult for me because the quality is just next level there so yeah yeah i I shouldn't have asked that follow-up question because now i feel like you answered the second one Uh, name a country that's underrated when it comes to their food no that's okay i can still i can i can uh still mess with that um I mean, is it underrated? India, you know, I think people are afraid to eat in India because they're afraid they're going to get sick. And Hmm. the street food in India is, listen, if you get a little sick, it'll be worth it. That shit is good. (laughs) Um, So it's not underrated. I think people know India as a food destination, but they play it safe. Mm. Don't play it safe, man. Just go for it. You'll be fine. Mm -hmm, Get mm -hmm. get some. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. My brother and I both got violently ill once from having uh, too many mango lassies, which is like a yogurt fruit drink. Uh, but hashtag worth it. <laughs> so worth it. It's, it's worth it. It's worth it. And I mean, also in South Brazil, the food really surprised me. I didn't really mm. I didn't know anything about Brazilian food and I don't claim to even be close to an expert even now. But I did not have a bad meal there. I just thought it was really fresh. and It was really, mm. you know hearty affordable it's good stuff i saw that you wrote an article recently a 10 dishes not to miss in brazil right yep that was interesting because i haven't really heard of it as a culinary destination but it looked like a lot of like beans and um you know barbecued like meats and uh well actually brazil is known for its uh its meat yeah right yep and so it's it is meat heavy for sure Mm. um but There's also, you know, depending on where you, Brazil is huge, right? There's a lot of Mm. like, you know, ingredients that are important to the indigenous people of Brazil. So like, you'll see a lot of that. And I just thought it was interesting. Uh, Like I got butter that had at one place, like that came with bread. It was kind of a nicer place and it had like sprinkled ants all over it, you know? And I mean, I just think it it was just, it was not what I was expecting in a very awesome way. Best bang for your buck. Food wise or travel wise or both? I guess it's food wise. Um, we'll leave it up to you. Oh, 
I, I feel like I've already said these places, but it is true. Malaysia, I mean, Malaysia or India or even Vietnam. Like I said, Southeast Asia is just a very, uh, it's a favorable bang to your buck. Um, for example, on that backpacking trip, I was in Vietnam for two weeks and I spent under $300 with everything that I did there everything and that's under two weeks grant not not including flight wow and you know i was staying in hostels and um living a different way than i live now not that i'm against staying in hostels but uh you know i was paying like two dollars a night for most of them meals were pretty much always under a dollar fifty same thing with india i was there for a week and i spent i spent around a hundred dollars in india for a week so yeah by far i know i've already kind of mentioned those places but yeah the yeah, in, in Vietnam, I was there for a month. I used to get the banh mi sandwiches on the side of the road, but instead of meat, I'd get like scrambled eggs in them with a bunch of herbs because they love their cilantro and all that stuff, okay. and then sweet chili sauce, and they were like 25 cents, it's... and that's what I had for breakfast every day. Yeah, and they're so good. I love how much how – so good. The, the amount of herbs they put in the food, it's just – it's it's yeah, it's great. And so it's good food for – you, know, you mm -hmm. don't always you don't have to associate affordable meaning low quality because it's really pretty far from the truth in my experience. All right, uh, best local drink, alcoholic or otherwise. Ooh, um, God, that's a tough one. I'm, no one's ever asked me that. That's okay. I'll think of something. One of my favorite. Uh, I I always try to drink the beer local to the country. You know, it's field mm -hmm. research. It's field research. Of course. Um, my favorite beer is San Miguel in the Philippines or Tusker in Kenya. Those are my two mm. top beers. Which of the seven wonders stands above the rest? Hmm. Uh, so this is an unpopular opinion, but the Taj Mahal. Um, act, and no, I got two. Great Wall of China or Taj Mahal. Great Wall of China, huh. it's just it's surreal uh the only bummer was there was a lot of trash so that was disappointing but that's kind of common and popular tourist spots um unfortunately i've cried at most of the <laughs> most of the world wonders i've seen um mm. just because it's it's a really nice opportunity that you know i've worked really hard to try to navigate doing this it was just a big goal of mine mm. um, yeah. but the taj mahal people are like it's just a building go at sunrise there's like nobody there you know they they say they open at six but they will let you in at 5 a.m and i went oh wow. i went at, pro tip yeah pro tip for real somebody told me that and i'm by six the place is packed and i was there at yeah. five and there were maybe 20 other people there and it so i think that added watching the sunrise over the taj mahal like doesn't really get much more epic than that so yeah cool wow well I mean, I think that's a wonderful place to end the show. Um, Caitlin, it was so great having you. This was a really fun conversation. Um, you can find Caitlin at her website slash blog, www.nomannomad.net. And what is your Instagram handle? At noman dot, so like a period, nomad. So N-O-M-A-N dot N-O-M-A-D. So on Instagram at noman.nomad um, and anywhere else. Uh, you can see my articles on the points guy. Just search Caitlin Rosati, New York daily news. It will be launching soon. Uh, and there will be a bunch of great food wrecks in uh, New York and yeah, just, just Google the name. Something will come up that I've written <laughs> before. Hopefully all good things, but Hey, you know, it's the internet. Uh <laughs> and, Cool. And if you wanted to learn a little bit more about us, you could find us on our website at www.gtspodcast.com, on Facebook at Globetrotters Podcast, on Instagram also at Globetrotters Podcast, uh, Twitter at Globetrot Pod. By the way, before you go, if you have a minute and you've been listening to us on Apple Podcast, leave us a review. It actually really helps us out. Um, and of course, give us a follow on social media. That helps us too. But um, if you could leave us a little review, um, that would be amazing. So thank you so much and have a good one. Bye. <laughs>